Okay, uh, my name is very difficult, uh, and uh, I, I've been teaching quite a lot in uh, Northern Ireland recently, so I, they, they came up with a solution because they couldn't say my name. So apparently you can call me Paul McCluskey. <laughs> <laughs> so today, for today, I'm Paul McCluskey. And, uh, okay, so Quo Valdis. Quo Valdis is um, Paul on the road to Damascus. This is Paul on the road to Kilkenny, I think. Uh, what, where are you going? Yeah, and, and that's kind of the theme. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done from the past. I'm going to talk about prevention because I think it's a neglected area, although we do do some. I'm going to talk about the man from South Africa, the woman from Germany, uh, where we are. I'm going to talk about a man from Bangalore. But the woman from, the woman from Germany, the man from Bangalore, in my view, are game changers. So, so that's why they're in red. Um, back to the future, and we'll talk about some hesitant steps into the future. I've been around for more than 40 years in psychology, and it's, uh, it, it's interesting to predict the future. I've seen lots of people predict the future 30 years ago, and they got it so wrong. So, but I'm not going to be around in 40 years to, to tell, so what do you say? Anyway, <laughs> the men from Philadelphia, development, delivery, and dissemination, and the man from the economics department, and something I can't read at the bottom, but there we go, I might have good cares. <laughs> okay, this is the man from South Africa, Monty Shapiro. He's the father of clinical psychology, and he's really interesting. Uh, he, he's, he, in, in, in British Charles, he was, in many ways, the originator. He's interesting because he was a consummate psychologist. I'm aware this is the Irish Psychological Society. He said psychology is an applied science. He said there is no difference between research and clinical practice. He also went on to say we should apply the methods and theories of general psychology to clinical settings. Uh, that, that this is that clinical psychology is not really a separate discipline, and I'm glad to be here at the Irish Psychological because I think that's an important point. He said we have to use reliable and valid assessment methods. We have to work clinically with the scientific method. But he was really strong on this, and, and I think that's right. Forming and testing hypotheses about the nature and correlates of clients' problems and seeking to test them out. And he talked not about diagnosis, but about dysfunction. If, if, if people, people talked about what their problem was, and so the problem said, if the problem was, my wife doesn't understand me, in a sense, that was his starting point. That's a dysfunction. Of course, it's true. Where is she? Um, anyway, so um, that, that, that you, that rather, than taking, rather than taking a diagnostic level, he, he was OK about diagnostic levels, as am I, but that dysfunction, the thing that people said that they had, and then you explored that. That was the key thing. He talked about the experimental evaluation of single case, which is still with us, and which is underused. So I think that's part of our future. And he said, these ideas describe the features which uniquely differentiates clinical psychology from other mental health professionals. In other words, we shouldn't be little bits of other <coughs> professionals. We should be a unique profession. I think we are, and I think we've proved that. <sighs> okay. I just want to say something about prevention. Um, essentially, when we see symptoms um, in people that we in, in the people that, that, that we eventually get to see one way or another, they've almost always started before the disorder itself, uh, and that provides us with opportunities for, for, for prevention. There comes a point where people make transition from subclinical symptoms. Into, into an untreated disorder. And the untreated disorder is one of the scandals that we often disregard, the duration. When I talk about OCD, one of the things I talk about is the fact that when I work with obsessional problems, obsessional problems are easy to treat. What's harder to treat is 12 years between 20 and, 20 and, and 32, when people do not receive treatment and the collateral damage that that causes, the misery of those missing years. Anyway. So untreated disorder, then treated disorder. Now prevention, there's primary prevention, which is where you look at resilience. There was a nice talk about resilience I went to a short time ago. Uh, we can look at critical incidents. We can look at how we can actually prevent people from developing problems when bad things happen. We can look at vulnerability. We can then look at secondary prevention, which is when people start to show the problems, and we can then identify those. And, and for example, the work of Fiona Chalikan uh, with perinatal OCD is a fantastic example of this, where you can actually start to pick people up before they've even developed the problem. And then there's tertiary prevention, which is what we spend most of our time doing, which is trying to halt 
the steady decline into despair which often mental health problems take people. And we're not doing enough on the left-hand side. That's what we need to do. I, and, and, and I think psychology is what we need in order to do that better. Let's now talk a little bit about the whole sort of process of evidence-based treatments. Um, there are many people, and I've encountered many of those people from the very beginning of my career to the present day, who believe that the mistake they've been making for 25 years is a sign of good clinical practice. And this is, you know, I think, one of the most pernicious things that we face. We would not put up with this um, in any other discipline. There are many things, in terms of what's called parity of esteem between mental and physical health, there are many things that we would not put up with. If you go to see your cardiologist, and your cardiologist says, well, I quite like leeches because you've know, used them for many years, you're probably not going to go for it. Anyway, that's an issue for us. Plural of anecdotes is not data. And again, I, I like telling stories, but it doesn't tell you uh, what's going So what matters. Well, our treatment effects really is obviously now. This is the woman from Germany. This is Anke Ehlers. Uh, and this is addressing the issue of first do no harm. And this is one of the game changers. But this is from 2000. Uh, and it's, OK, well, what you can, what's at the bottom is the baseline. Yeah, okay, baseline, um, and that's three months, and that's two years. And this is impact of events. So this is trauma. This is PTSD symptoms following a road traffic accident. And what, what they do is a single session of debriefing in the A&E, in the casualty department. And this is looking at the decline of post-traumatic symptoms, which is great, isn't it? And so you realize that the line at the top um, are the people who had the active treatment. The line at the bottom are the people who had nothing. They, they didn't have that. And so what you're seeing, and, and again, if you, were, if you were in the control condition, if you were in the condition that, sorry, in the debriefing condition, if you got this debriefing, then, and if you were the therapist, you would have thought that they'd done okay. And you would have thought that, if you were the patient, you would have thought you were a bit better two years later. But it's that comparison with the, with the people who got nothing that tells you that damage has been done that a psychologist or a counsellor or whatever has severely damaged people and that that damage has lasted for three years, two years, whatever it is, two, two years, yeah. Think how much more damage we could manage if we saw people twice a week for seven years. That would just be so much more. <laughs> that is why it is no longer sufficient to say, I just know it works. Or, I did a workshop on it. Even though on Saturday, I did a workshop on it and I like it. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do flower fairy therapy or, or whatever it is. And, and, and it's not acceptable. It's not a reasonable thing to do. And that's changed the world, in my view. Yeah, that, that we can do harm, and we can do a lot of harm, and we have no awareness of it unless we evaluate it. Okay, so we need science. Well, what kind of psychological science? Well, this is a drug metaphor, and we're all familiar with it, and we operate within it to a degree. And it goes, you know, it's good for antibiotics. It goes to clinical practice. You know, informs outcome research, and outcome research informs kind of practice. And if you can gather 20,000 cases uh, in the whole of Ireland who've got had antibiotic A and antibiotic B, you can start to make some really cool conclusions, and you can start to change your practice. But I'm a clinical psychologist, and my maximum sample size in any trial has been 80. Yeah, I mean 80 per group, admittedly, but still, it's not many, and we don't, we can't do that. So. Yeah, these whole, this issue of the levels of evidence in evidence-based medicine, it's a problem for us. Because we can't, you know, we can't, here, here it is again, you know, systematic reviews and randomized trials. Randomized. I mean, you look in most areas of our field and try to do a systematic, system, a, a systematic review, a meta-analysis, whoa, there's a problem. Sometimes there are no studies at all. Sometimes there are three studies. There are many areas of our field <laughs> where there are more meta-analyses than there are primary studies. <laughs> I'm not joking. It is, it's about 50, it runs about 50% at the moment. Yeah, and that's completely mad. Um, so, this is not a good way of developing psychotherapy, psychological therapies. Yeah. It's not going to cut the mustard. So, what else can we do, it says at the bottom. <laughs> well, to the rescue, a couple of gentlemen called Isaac and Fitzgerald, okay, and they say, well, okay, if you're not going to use evidence-based medicine with its reliance on the randomized controlled trial and meta-analyses and 
units of measure of the big old ratio. What else have you got? Well, they came up with some solutions. And so people who reject evidence-based medicine, here's your choices. Eminence-based medicine. Radiance of white hair is, a, is an indicator. So that's all right. And you can use a luminometer, optical density. The eminence-based medicine, how, and I'm, I'm, I'm high on that one as well, but you know, how strident you are. Um, and then you can try eloquence-based medicine. Smoothness of tongue, I don't score on that one. Smoothness of tongue. Um, and, yeah, then, Isaac Fitzgerald favor this one. Providence-based medicine, they say, basically, it's when, this is when you leave it to the Almighty. You know, and you say, well, there's nothing you can do, so just leave it to God. And he said, basically, you do no harm with that, you know, because you don't, you don't actually do anything, and that's quite good. And then there's diffidence-based medicine, and that's where you go, <laughs> nothing's going to work. And then there's nervousness-based medicine, um, which is yeah, where, where you just, just worry, make sure nobody, nobody sues you. And then the last one, which I think we'll show, is confidence-based medicine. And the comment of Edson, he says, it says at the bottom, confined to surgeons and psychoanalysts. <laughs> and you can't see that bit, so there we go. Okay, let me tell you about the man from Bangalore. The man from Bangalore is another world changer. He's not just because he's in Bangalore. I was lucky enough to make a trip to Bangalore to see my very good friend, Jannard and Red, who runs the world's biggest OCD clinic. Maybe there's a bigger one in China. But on the day I was there, they had 60 new patients and lots of repeat patients and so on. And he asked permission for some of his patients if I could sit in. And, and they very, some of them very kindly said I could sit in on his sessions, and that was nice. And what happened was a guy came in, and, and just before he came in, Jordan said, I can see from the referral letter that this man is originally from Lucknow. He's in the north, and Bangalore is a long way south. He said he's recently moved here, and he's, he's asked for an appointment. And the man came in with his big sheaf of papers, big fat sheaf of papers in his, in his hand. And, and, uh, and, and Jonathan said, I see you come from Lucknow, why is that? He said, oh, it's because of these papers. He said, what are those papers? Those papers were the nice guidelines for the treatment of OCD. So he looked online and found that he suffered, these were, the problems he was having was OCD. And he then checked where he could get the number one recommended treatment, which is CBT. And the answer was Nimhans in, in Bangalore, that, that, that place. Mosley in the east, it needs to be called, apparently. Anyway, so he says, I've come for treatment. Now, if that can happen in Bangalore, if that can happen in India, it can happen in Ireland, it can happen in England, and it can happen in Germany, it can happen everywhere. And it should. We should be empowering people to understand the evidence and to seek out the best available treatment, because that's what I do, and I think that's what you do. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, little anecdote, yeah, I went to see my doctor about, I've got a rheumatic problem with my toes, and I went to my doctor, and I checked the nice guidelines first, so I didn't warn the doctor, I checked the nice guidelines, <laughs> and so when he suggested surgery, I said, well, before we get to surgery, is there anything a bit less? <laughs> he said, well, there's always the steroid injection, in, in, injections into the joints, and I said, yeah, but is there anything else? And he said, what do you mean? He said, well, the nice guidelines say the first line should be podiatry. He said, oh, I suppose we can. Now, I can tell you, I've now got inserts in my shoes, which means my toes don't hurt anymore and haven't for three years. Yeah, and I haven't had surgery and I haven't had the steroid injections. I went in, <coughs> I went in, and, I, and it was a shame that my GP did not share the evidence with me. And it's a shame that many of us and our colleagues do not share the evidence with our patients, because that is what they're entitled to, to understand the effects, the advantages and disadvantages of what we offer, and the effect above all the effectiveness, because I do not want an ineffective treatment for myself or my family. I don't think you, and I certainly don't want it for my patients, because that way I'm failing in my duty. <coughs> okay, so how do we deal with this? Well, we deal with this by looking at how we actually progress. And the way we progress is this thing I call empirically grounded interventions. And it starts with clinical practice. The people who really know their shit are people like Sigmund Freud, he knew his shit. He, he, he really, I don't think he put it that way, but he, <laughs> he, he was a phenomenologist. He listened to patients. Then more recently, you have Aaron Beck, and you have Joe Wolpe, and you have David Clark, and Jack Rackman. People who spent time with their patients and listened very hard 
to what their patients said. And on the basis of that, they came up with theories. And for some people, that was enough. But for other people, and Joe Wolpe being, is, is the, the father of behavior therapy, is the one who said we can do outcome research, which was a weird thing to say at the time, but hey. And then theory informs outcome research. But outcome research does not inform theory. Otherwise, you'd all be using Harrington's theory of transmarginal inhibition, right? You use that, right? Harrington's theory? Well, of course you don't. That was what Wilpe used to give us systematic desensitization. That's what he used to give us that. So, but, but actually, that theory was rubbish. The treatment worked, but it didn't help us understand the theory. Okay, so, so how do we get the theory? Well, we get the theory through, it says, basically, experimental studies and so on. So it's like discovering things like, Rachman says in 74, he says, look, guess what happens? If people with OCD either wash or don't wash, if they wash, they feel better. If they don't wash, they feel better and it takes a bit longer. And then they don't need to wash afterwards. And that piece of research, that phenomenological research, that really cool stuff he did in 1974, uh, whatever, gives us the absolute confidence that our patients will get better at the time if we, if we managed to do that. At the time, people said he was a dangerous criminal because he was going to send them out. And I won't go into the psychoanalytic view of that, but he was regarded as somebody, he and others were regarded as dangerous people. So that's how we developed it. But the thing that I'm talking about is evidence-based patient choice. And that is the thing that we should be allowing. And it will allow us to disinvest in the useless therapies. And we get that through things like clinical guidelines. And we should be sharing with our patients what we understand by the way, I'm going to happy to make these slides available on the website. You can take photos, but I'm happy to make the slides available if it's uh, something you can do. So that's how we're going to progress. And I think this will change, this will change everything. Yeah, putting it hand in, our job is to empower patients to understand you know, what's going on for them and, 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 and how they might be helped with that. Okay, so I'm going to brag about cognitive behavior therapy because it's a marvellous thing. And it's going to be supplanted, it's just that it's not going to be supplanted by anything we've got at the moment, but at some point, as psychotherapy of the old style was supplanted by behaviour therapy, and there's behaviour therapy by cognitive behaviour therapy, and there's something waiting around the corner. So it's always going to be like this, but we've done it in a particular way. The strategy that is identifying core psychological processes and maintaining things, this is anxiety, but same is true for other things, depression, psychosis, and so on. So core psychological processes, and we do that through experiments, perspective studies, mediational studies, and so on. And then we develop novel treatments to target these processes. And I just draw your attention, I'm not going to talk about it, there's not time, to the wonderful work of Dan Freeman in Oxford. Dan's, Dan's turned the whole thing on its head, because we used to say, oh, if you've got psychosis and you don't treat the worry. Turns out that's not true. If you've got psychosis and you've got worry and you've got poor sleep, you treat the worry and the poor sleep, the psychosis doesn't go away, but it is helped a bit, and the people live better lives. But anyway, there you go. And then we look at outcomes. And you know, the outcomes of the strategy, looking at what's going on and then trying to solve it, um, has resulted in highly influential models. One of the most cited papers in the world, actually, in psychology, David Clark's called The Theory of Panic. <sighs> <laughs> Mine's way behind. <laughs> um, treatments, that, and also the demonstration that treatments are superior to equally credible interventions. More of that in a sec. And then leading to guideline recommendations and in, independent guidelines. Nice is the envy of the world, uh, I think you may use, and for, for good reasons. Um, because of the way it's set up. And it's under constant attack. One of the things that I hate about things like Twitter and so on, is the way that things like NICE get attacked constantly um, because by people who do not like the evidence being out there. NICE is putting the evidence out there. It's terrible in some ways. You know, it makes mistakes, but hey, it's very good. It's the best we've got. There must be something else about there. So the men from Philadelphia, Joseph Wolpe, I mentioned him already, and Aaron T. Beck, um, and a friend. I don't know who he is, but he was <laughs> photobombing Tim Beck. <laughs> <laughs> So how good is the evidence base for cognitive behavior therapy? It's not bad, and you have to judge it in this way. You need to think, what's the gold standard? The gold standard is the randomized control trial, and that is sort of true. We'll come back to that, it's not the only thing, but it's important. And CBT needs to be superior to no treatment, you know, awaiting this control. 
So an equally credible alternative psychological treatment to control for non-specific factors, and at least as effective as medication, because one of the things I learned in Bangalore, one of the many things I learned in Bangalore, was the difference between CBT and fluoxetine, yeah, Prozac, uh, which is many thousands of repeats. You know, basically, you can, you, can treat, you can treat somebody with OCD for about 10 cents a week in India uh, using fluoxetine, and it takes, it's a bit more expensive to have CBT, uh, and that's a dynamic that we have to deal with in the longer term as well. There's something at the bottom, and I don't know what it is, but there you go. Okay, well, this is just this is just a, this is almost a, a summary of the summaries, really. Um, how effective is CBT in terms of recovery? Okay, so recovery rate in in in, in randomised control trials is sitting around sixty to seventy percent. So that's all right. We're doing all right. Still, still a lot to do. I mean, my view is the treatment failures that people are most interested in. But then the other question is, does it generalize? Does, do the results of the trials generalize? I'll come back to that in a moment about this thing about generalization, because it turns out generalization from trials is a lot better than you think it is. So it generalizes. So what we've learned, I think, through probably 60 years of, of, of good empirical grounding, is how psychological treatments work. So let me share that with you, how psychological treatments work. People suffer from mood-related problems because they think situations are more negative than they really are. That's a fact. So as close as you get to a fact in psychology. We don't really have facts, but you know, it's as close as you get. So basically, people get upset because they, in a clinical way because they think things are more negative than they really are. And what treatment does is to help the person to consider things in a more flexible way, to consider an alternative, less negative way of thinking about it because people get stuck. If you're depressed, it's hard to see it any other, anything else than you're a bad person or you know that, that, that things have turned to shit in your hands or whatever. And if you're anxious, it's hard to see that anything of the, these, these symptoms you've got mean that you're going to die of a heart attack or whatever it is. So alternative, less negative ways of understanding the problems, which really have to meet two criteria. It has to make sense in terms of past experience. And, uh, past experience. and this takes you to the key to good psychological treatment, which in my view is formulation in terms of empirically grounded understanding. So, so the evidence coming in to tell us that, for example, people with panic have an enduring tendency to catastrophically misinterpret the bodily symptoms of normal anxiety, which makes them feel anxious, which increases those symptoms, and that's what panic at attack is. And that people with OCD think that the thought they've had mean that, that some terrible thing's going to happen unless they stop it, and so they do compulsive behavior, which then stops them from discovering the things they're afraid of don't happen. So it has to make sense, that's what formulation does. But also, it's not, trust me, I'm a white-haired professor with a gray beard, or perhaps a white beard these days, anyway. Trust me, I'm a doctor, or trust me, I'm a psycho thingamajigger. It's don't trust me, work with me, in order to work out what on earth is going on. So good therapy, is about two or more family members, and so at least two people, working together to find out how the world really works. It's not about thinking more positively or more rationally. It's about understanding what is really going on. Because if when you go out, if you go to the supermarket, you can have a heart attack and die, don't go to the supermarket. It's really simple. If, on the other hand, your problem is that you're, you've got that funny old vicious circle going on, then you need to go to the supermarket to discover that it doesn't happen just have to hope your therapist is right. <laughs> so good therapy is about self-help, really. It's about you supporting, you as the therapist, supporting the person to conduct the self-help. It's also a partnership of two experts working on the problem in close collaboration. Me, supposedly experts in anxiety or OCD or whatever, and so you, you walk into my office and then say, my problem is blah, blah. Um, I'm an expert in CBT, but I actually know virtually nothing about you as the person who's walked into my office. You know everything about you. You know how old you are, you know how many kids you've got, you know how your symptoms are, you know everything. And so what you do in treatment is you put these two levels of expertise together in a mutually respectful relationship, collaborative as far as possible. You can't get rid of the power relationship entirely. You can go quite a long way. And you work together. And then the person does the work. And if you're doing it well, when the person shakes you by the hand 12 sessions later and says, thank you so much, 
It's been lovely spending time with you. My problem in the meantime, I've been able to solve my problem, but it's been good having these conversations with you. you in the subtext, you didn't do anything. <laughs> Result. <laughs> that is the best possible outcome. And it should be true. It should be, you didn't do anything other than actually help the person see how things work and they did the self help. That's what good therapy is about. Okay, so let's step hesitantly in the future. And I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a few predictions. So they're not actually really difficult predictions to make because the future's already here. Um, it's a way that we don't now I'm old. Forty years ago, I remember conversations, and I remember being a bit amazed by me forty years ago. So I remember my clinical my senior clinical psychology colleague saying things like do we really want to train nurses to do behaviour therapy? Because it's behaviour therapy in those days. Do we want to give away our skills? Subtext. We're going to run out of patients. There's not going to be enough people for us to see. And I'm serious. These conversations happen. Don't you hear old enough to remember these conversations? Don't give away, don't give away our skills. Don't be bloody stupid. I mean, how many... I mean, four. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> What we need to do, what the people in this room need, need, need to do, because you guys are experts, yeah? You guys know what you're doing. So you need to be doing development. You need to make the treatments we've got, which are okay, but are far from perfect. You need to be doing development work. And then we have to get delivery. We need to get these out to people. And we also have to disseminate that as well. We also have to do quality improvement. We have to make sure that what we're doing is constantly improving. Interesting about how we'll do that. We'll come back to that. Development involves innovation, evolution, refinement, and identifying necessary and sufficient elements. Because when I do therapy, when I do therapy still, what I do is some combination of a, probably 80% of bullshit, smoke, and mirrors, and 20% of the good stuff. It's just 20% of the good stuff. The trouble is, I can't disaggregate them. Because I do 12 hours of, of three treatment, or 25 hours of treatment, and in that is the 20% and the 80%, and I don't know what's the difference. And if I just drop it in half, the risk is I've got rid of the 20%. So it's really important. We need to, and, 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 and if you doubt that, let me just remind you what Joe Woolpe's treatment was. Joe Woolpe treatment for specific phobias, 80 hours of Jacobsonian relaxation, followed by 120 hours of systematic desensitization. Two hours, sorry, 200 hours, not two hours, 200 hours, of treatment. Nowadays, it takes two hours to get to get much better results. Two hours, one session of treatment, ninety percent of the patients will be better at the end of treatment. Seventy percent of them will still be better two years later. So we've taken out from that the treatment of the bullshit smoking mirrors, and we've got to probably fifty percent. So we can probably get down another hour if we're good. Okay, so. It, we need to acknowledge that a lot of what we do is bullshit smoke and mirrors. That if you wave your fingers to and fro and ask people to follow your eyes, that might not be what's doing it. It might be something else. I'm not singling that out because there's a lot of stuff that everybody do, which is, yeah, the trick is to work out what it is. Delivery and dissemination comes off from that platform. And, you know, we, we, go, we will basically die as a profession if we don't actually continue to do that work. So... Come back to that, actually. Um, this, is, this is my kind of warning, really. That we start, there's Joe Wolpe. He does a, gets basic treatments, theory-driven. Some people are still doing Joe Wolpe stuff, by the way. You know, I'm, I'm still amazed that people still spend up to two sessions predicting hierarchies, which were a really key part of Wolpe's treatment, which Gordon Paul showed in 1966 were completely, completely useless and irrelevant. But there you go. Anyway, basic treatment. And then you try and improve access. So Joe Wolpe trains Arnold Lazarus and a couple of his mates. So, so we, we, we're disseminating it a bit. But it didn't stop there. And then you've got Gordon Paul improving the treatment in 1966 through very, very capable research. And then you start to improve access to that. And you just carry this on. And you never stop. You never stop. And here's the problem, here's the, the, the challenge our profession faces, because if we do that, and we're here, because we're, we're not here, we're here, we've got the perfect treatment. If then we deliver it using apps and online treatments, which are perfectly reasonable things to do, and think, that's it, we don't have any more development to do, so we can just stop. 
that's a danger. The danger is that we don't do further development. And the risk we've got is that we, as the expert professionals who can do development, turn into technicians who are delivering app-based treatments. And that's not a good place to be. We can develop those app-based treatments, and we, we just always assume that a lot of it is going to be bullshit smoke and mirrors. OK, so I'm going to go back to the whole stepping thing. This is just to say that this is this thing about giving psychological treatments away. Um, the psychological expertise needed. Basically, I am expensive in the health service terms. You know, a lot of people in this room, you're all very expensive. And we should not be, we should not be really treating people who've got recent onset anxiety problems. It's a great pleasure when you do, because people get really a lot better a lot quicker. But, but we, we should be sitting down here with people with multiple chronic and disabling problems and so on. And, and, and there's a kind of, yeah. There's a narrowing down of the number of people, and, and, and the whole thing about stepped care, stepped care involves delivering treatment at these different stages. And that's clearly the future. I mean, I, I, I can predict the future because it's already here to a degree, and I'll show you the way in which it's obviously manifest. So moving forward, just give you a brief case study from my own research. I'm not going to talk about the early days when we did case studies and various research studies and so on, we jump straight to the first of the big RCTs we did. And what we learned from that randomized controlled trial in 98 was that CBT did extremely well for the treatment of health anxiety, which previously had been untreatable. It was a, it was a kind of treatment failure, we think. And it did much better than the waiting list. And this is a problem that by large doesn't resolve if you've got a six month thing. But also, if we did a highly credible alternative treatment, which is something called stress management, they also did better the wait list, not as good as CBT, but better than the wait list. So we now have two treatments for this, and that applies stress management. It's fine, it, it's difficult to strip it further down, so CBT kind of wins because you can reduce it from 16 sessions to 8 sessions. The applied stress management doesn't seem to strip back, so that's a problem. Anyway, we do that. And then people said, our critics said, David Clark, Paul Tarkovskis, yeah. And Hackman, you guys, you 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 know, you you're, you're eloquent, you're clever, you're working at the University of Oxford with people who live in ivory towers, and so what you do doesn't apply to our patients, to the patients in Kilkenny or in Birmingham or not that I'm making a comparison, but uh, <laughs> thought about that as I did it, but there you go. Anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah, elsewhere. And, 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 and I got this invite to go to Copenhagen um, to, to teach them. And I said, well, how about I'll teach you in this non-research clinic, I'll teach you how to do treatment health anxiety. That's great. I said, but I'll do it if you'll agree to evaluate it in an open trial, just the first 16 patients after you're trained, just to see if you can get the same results as we can get as we get in, in Oxford and London. And so, non-research clinic, CBT therapists, who were CBT therapists, but they had no experience of health anxiety. And so, five days of workshop training, had to spend some time in Copenhagen. Follow-up supervision, had to go repeatedly to Copenhagen. I used to bring Danish cakes back every time. Uh, that was fun. Anyway, 16 consecutive referrals. The treatment, we modified it a bit. Guess what? They did just as well as the patients in Oxford and London. And they took this proudly to the Danish uh, Psychological Society. It was kind of like this meeting, you know. And they said, look, look, we've, we, we've got these results and we're a non-research clinic. And several of the colleagues said, oh, no, 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 hang on. No, this doesn't, this is no use to us. So why is that? I said, you've done research. You're a research clinic. And do you know what, my friends, they were right. All in our team had become a research clinic. And the moral of the story is we should all be research clinics. We should all be evaluating what we do all the time. And we owe it to people because you know, I think you know, that if you've got a problem, medical or psychological problem, what you should be doing is go and find a trial and enroll in it. Because when you, when you, when you enroll in a trial, they're going to they're gonna look at you really carefully, do a really good assessment. They will measure things, measure the hell out of you. The, the, the treatment will be top class and the supervision will be top class and that's what our patients deserve. So yeah, we should all be research colleagues and they were kind of right because 
Because Nicholas Grimm then said, Paul, before you leave for the last time, we've got this big research grant to do a randomized trial, and it's going to be led by a guy called Per Soros, and he's a psychoanalyst. And he wants to compare the normal treatment of Denmark, which is brief psychedelic psychotherapy, with CBT. Would you mind coming back to Denmark a lot? No, I didn't mind at all. So, okay, same thing as before. And we compared CBT, psychedelic therapy, and wait list. That's the Cochrane collaboration fault. That, that's weird, but never mind. Anyway, but then we allocate weightless people into the brief psychodynamic treatment. This is led by a psychoanalyst. So the, the, the lesions effect is the way opposite to what it usually is. I remember how upset Per was when we, when, when we broke the blind on this study. So this is the primary outcome measure, the health anxiety inventory. There's the weightless. Brief psychodynamic treatment did no better than weightless on any measure at any time. CBT does rather well, does a bit like it happened in, in Oxford, elsewhere, and so on. A lot of thought about why that is, because I did not expect that, and, and the deeper, of course, did not expect that to happen. And we think this is a problem that is particularly not amenable to any kind of spontaneous remission. We think health anxiety is a particularly intractable problem, but we don't know. That's, that's the uh, Beck anxiety inventory, just to show that there wasn't kind of, you know, sort of generalized effect. Again, same, no, no difference between psychodynamic and weightless. The CBT does uh, better than both. Okay, so then people say, that's fine, but you're still expensive, guys. And yeah, we are. We're, we're expensive. And so what we did was that, that we, uh, uh, the other thing is in health anxiety, there's, there's an awful lot of people who, in, in general hospitals, that's where most people with health anxiety are, if you want a risk factor for, for being worried about your health, being sick is that risk factor. So, the CHAMP trial, this is an NIHR-funded trial, costs a lot of money, um, and we basically screened people in general hospital clinics, which means that some of them had also coexisting heart disease and cancer and other things, and some didn't, okay? And then what we did was that we compared, compared either CBT with an enhanced treatment as usual. I'm not going to go into details, but in order to make sure we got good follow-ups, we did a little bit with people, so we gave people mini CBT versus full-on CBT. But the, the, the treatment, the idea was that we were going to deliver the treatment using people, the people who are really the experts, not ourselves, but so that was clinic nurses. So the aim was, and again, there were problems with, with managing that, but the aims were that, say, a diabetes nurse would be working in an endocrinology clinic and so on. We gave people four days of training. We did supervision going forward. I think it's crucial, but we've never done the trial to check it. Um, and we had two primary outcomes. The health anxiety inventory, which is one we used in previous trials. To power that study for the health anxiety inventory, we, we actually only needed 30 people per cell. But the thing we were really interested in was the money. So I'm now going to take you to the money, the economic comparison. And what we wanted to do was to show that if we counted the cost of the training and the supervision and the time spent by those therapists, whether we could save money, basically, or, or at least pay for itself. Okay, so 219 people got CBT health anxiety, standard treatment 225. It's intention to treat all the usual things we do with these trials. It's all published in a big NHI monograph and in the Lancet. The difference is though here, that compared to usual studies, we went a lot longer and there's some very hard work being done. But this is just the outcome. So right from the off, CBT health anxiety is doing way better um, than treatment as usual. It's still better two years later, uh, sorry, five years after we Started the treatment. We're doing the eight-year follow-ups at the moment, so, so, but but we're starting to lose people for all kinds of reasons. So it's working and it's consistently working. This is a cheap treatment. Comes the money in a sec. That's anxiety and depression. Also, they're not the primary variables, but they're also showing prolonged effects. Okay, costs. That's what it costs in pounds. So that's probably these. The tomorrow that will be three thousand euros. No, that's after Brexit, sorry, 3,000 euros, okay, so anyway, so, yeah, 500, 500 euros um, was the cost of the treatment, and that includes supervision and so on, and there's the, this is the mean difference, so the CBT group got observably, not significantly, observably lower costs across the board, so that's 
accommodation, that's, that's essentially bed, bed costs. Um, hospital services, that's you know, tests and, and, and so on. Community <coughs> services, that's general practice. Uh, and medication, that's pharmacy. But again, with the health service, we can catch these costs. So, basically, problem we've got, it's not statistically different and it's not statistically equivalent. So it just falls between the, the stools. That's the one-year outcomes. We're, 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 the, the health economists are still working on the later outcomes. I'm pretty sure that it's going to cross economically uh, at year two. But if you want to do a study, with, I have some advice. If you want to do a study with major component health economics like this, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not doing health economics. It's very hard work. Anyway, so will it pay for itself? Yeah, it'll pay for itself, basically. It, it looks pretty clear that this is going to pay for itself. So, and then we've extended this, and there isn't time to go into this, because I've, I've got about another 10 minutes, and that's all right, okay. Um, we've extended this now to persistent physical symptoms, thing called medically unexplained symptoms sometimes. We get, we've now got a, trans, a hybrid transdiagnostic specific treatment we're developing. So that means, you know, that essentially there's a kind of core of the treatment which, which is the same across people with irritable bowel, and fatigue, and sleep problems. But there's other bits that are different because it if you're worried about shitting yourself it has an irritable bowel, or you're worried that, you'll, that you won't be able to move if you watch the TV, then you're going to need some different work being done later, which is why it's hybridized. And then we've done some really exciting work with long term conditions. Because it turns out, and again, you know this economically, we know that if you've got diabetes, then you're very likely to be quite depressed. Actually, about half the people with diabetes will also be depressed. And we know also that the medical treatment of people who are both depressed and diabetic, the medical treatment, although not the psychological treatment, is about twice as much. We also know that if you treat <coughs> depression and anxiety, that the costs go down and people's happiness goes well, the depression goes down too. So, so, so that's where the long-term conditions have come in and some very exciting developments there. Let's just turn now to delivery and dissemination, okay? I'm gonna to talk to you about IAPS because over the water you've got this thing called IAPS, which you've probably heard of, and, it's, and it, it's, been, it's reviled and celebrated in equal measure, uh, and so on. What happened? Well, this is, this is the man from the economics department. This is a guy called Richard Layard. He's an economics professor. And what happened is that a psychologist and an economist walked into a bar together. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that way. David Clark, Richard Layard started talking. They were actually talking, I, I, I told this is true, in a queue waiting for a cup of coffee at a meeting. And David was talking about how effective CBT is, and, and, and Richard said, yeah, but have you looked at the costs and looked at how much money you save? Uh, and he said, no, and they got together, and that's where IAPS comes from. It also got support from all types of government. Now, we're probably about to get a lunatic government, so this may not continue, but at the moment, it managed to cut across both you know, Labour, Conservative, and Coalition, and they carried it on in their, in their budgets. Okay. They basically said there's more people in mental health services with common mental health problems than with psychosis. Psychosis is important to debilitating problem, but actually uh, the treatment has, has tended to be focused on those people. But common mental health problems are big and they're expensive. So about loss output, 17 billion per, per, per annum in the UK. Um, 9 billion is direct cost to the exchequer. Now here's the here's the interesting thing, and here's the thing. That, that I think the world needs to think about, and that Ireland, I don't know what's happening in Ireland, but I think Ireland needs to think about this too, because here, here's what happens. If, if you help people in the health service or help the health system, then that costs money to the health system or, or to the individuals getting it. But, and if they do it well, then money is saved, and that, that comes in taxes and reduced welfare parents. But they're different departments, and the money doesn't flow. So what Richard and David did was says, how about we join these things up? And so we can save you money by doing good. But it has to, you have to join up health and the exchequer, you know, the, 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 the finance people and the welfare people. And that's the argument, that you can save money by doing good. And that's what's happened. Effective psychological treatments, virtually nobody getting evidence-based treatment. So increased provision would pay for itself. So it's a little bit like that health anxiety thing. That was the argument. So you're increasing the availability of effective, nice recommended psychological treatments for depression and anxiety by training large numbers of psychological therapists. I'll give you the numbers in a minute. You train them to do evidence-based treatments. Don't, not just the thing that went to the latest workshop on. 
You deploy them in specialized local services. You put them on the ground where the problems are, and then you measure outcomes for everybody, not just the few that the, th the clinicians are prepared to do. That's absolutely crucial, actually, that you measure outcomes for everybody. Okay, so what's happened so far? This is 2019. Um, there's, a, there's a nice review if anybody's interested in, in, in the data, because the data is huge now, because you have all this data. Okay, it's transformed, it's transformed the treatment of anxiety and depression. You've got now specialist services in every, every, every health board equivalent kind of thing. A million people be seen each year in the services. About all those people, some of them don't go on to treatment, about half of those people end up going to treatment, which is rather better than most services, interestingly. This is a figure that gets attacked a lot. But most people coming into any services, a fair proportion don't go on to get treatment. Outcomes recorded in 99% of cases. You're getting treatment outcomes for everybody in the service. That is unbelievable. And it also has some really positive consequences. The average length for treatment is 20 days. 7 out of 10, about 68% of people improve and about 52% recover. I'll show you those data more in a minute. So what's happened? Going forward, we've trained so far 9,000 therapists. The aim is to train 16,000 new therapists. So there's new therapists in England uh, now and there's going to be 16,000 of those. Um, the NICE guidelines are being applied and it's not just CBT, there are other therapies as well. The there's a national curriculum, so the training is standardized and, and, and at high consent. There's published competency, so you can check whether, and your patients can check whether they're getting the treatment they should have, because they can see the competencies as well, and say, excuse me, when you say you give me CBT, why am I lying on this couch? Um, success is to be judged by out to the target, recovery target was 50%, because that was the point where you very definitely were saving money. Not just cocaine for itself, but saving money. Self-referral was also allowed, that we were no longer putting gatekeepers in there, and that has turned out to be really important for BME uh, and, and other minority groups, people who are reluctant to go through their GP because of uh, well, a range of things. So that's been successful too. This is the number of people treated up till um, 2017 as the, the thing unfolded. So we're looking at 140,000 uh, or so um, in, in each of these quarters. So that's pretty good. Recovery rates. It got better as time went on because what was happening was these services were monitoring and then they were saying, do you know what? We don't do it very well. How can we make it better? Not only were they monitoring, but their recovery rates are posted on public websites. You can look at the websites now and see what any particular area, what the recovery rates would be. You can imagine that put a certain amount of pressure on the services. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Recovery rates are now climbing, still climbing, basically. This is, this is um, actually next to next to me. This is the Aylesbury uh, service, and they were doing. They noticed their head of service, Uncle John Pym, <coughs> basically noticed that their recovery rates were amongst the worst around, basically. And so what he did was he then, he then set about, with his team, to work out why that was. And it turned out that it was a lot to do with supervision, that people felt out of their depth in them. So they, they put in place, at the point we get the uptick, they put in place improved arrangements of supervision to support people in doing better. And you can see that the recovery rate has gone from sub-50% <coughs> to hovering around 70% and so on. That's possible because of the 100% um, or 99% uh, data recovery rates. Lots of things coming out of this now in terms of looking at things. So one of the things, well, let me, let me talk about it this time. Yes, there's probably only just. Future development of IAPT is like this. There's a, there's a problem with IAPT because immediately you improve access to psychological therapies and you get 50% of people better. Then 50% of people are not recovered. Of those, probably 20% are not touched. Now you've got 200,000 people a year whose expectations have been raised and who need other services. And the elephant in the IAPT room, as far as I'm concerned, is the need for now better secondary and tertiary care services. 
And that's fine, because that's a good problem to have, because these were people who were just crying in a corner before. They were not actually failing to be helped, they just weren't being helped at all. Okay, so, to conclude, yeah, it's a very good point to conclude. I'll, I'll actually have one more slide, but I'll, I'll just give my concluding slide. Science goes by stages. This was, this was a man called Max Hamilton who, who said this to me. He said, in the first stage, we know nothing but believe we know everything. He said, psychiatry and psychology has been in that stage for many years, but we're now moving out of it. He said, the second stage, we know nothing and believe we know nothing. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> there are no further stages. And that's right. And that is why, again, we can't just rely on the apps and the rest of it. I just want to show you one other thing. Just one other thing. Which is uh, not that one. Not that one. These are my supplementary slides. Oh, I think it was that one before. Okay, well, you can just about see it. This is the, the value of. of um, uh, of, of kind of uh, getting complete data because there's there's an issue that if you uh, I, I don't know if in Ireland you have, there are areas where there's a there's a great deal of poverty and deprivation others where where things are where people are well off certainly true in England and people say ah oh, look that you know that the, these problems you're seeing they're all to do with poverty and austerity and uh, and, and, and you know the, the, the discrimination against people and, and, and domestic violence. All that stuff, which is undoubtedly these are undoubtedly contributors to mental health problems. So and the fact that people in in the poorer areas do worse says we shouldn't really be. We should actually be focusing instead on, on making these areas richer, less deprived. And so on. And I agree with that. We should definitely not. We should be lifting up those areas. But should we not be offering psychological treatment? So. Or is it that what we're seeing is that poor areas have poor services? And what happened here was that in the IAPT, um, there's, there's two areas. There's two areas. Now, if you know England, you know, you'll know that Windsor is a very poor area, a lot of immigrants, <laughs> poverty, horrible accommodation, so as opposed to slough next door. Now, Slough is where the Queen lives. <laughs> Am I getting this wrong? I'm not sure. Anyway, the, cle the Queen lives there. And uh, there's a lot of big houses and so on. Now, the thing about these two areas, they're not right next door to each other, and they have the same amount of service. So the same amount of money is being spent on providing the psychological treatment. And this, this is a really interesting comparison, because in terms of recovery rates in Windsor, it's 56%. Um, in Slough, it is, hang on, I can tell from up here, it is 58%. So, um, so essentially, there is no difference when you provide an equivalent service. The recovery rates are good. That's not to say that Slough should not have more you know, resources and, 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 and better housing and so on, but it is to say it is a mistake to say it's all down to that, and that psychological treatments, we shouldn't be offering psychological treatments, or you'll be favouring other things instead. So I'll take you back to what was really my last slide, which is that one, and thank you very much.